Shiloh Bible Church family. These are intense days with many challenges and enormous opportunities. I'm glad to be living in and prepared for such a time as this. The elders at Shiloh are choosing to address this healthcare situation with the spirit of courage, faith, compassion, and hope. At the same time, we want to be wise and keep the health and well-being of our congregation as a top priority in light of the coronavirus. After much discussion and prayerful consideration, we have decided in the interest of the health and safety of our community to take immediate steps to encourage social distancing here at our campus. So from March the 15th to March 25th, 2020, we have canceled all church worship services and activities here at Shiloh. So thank you for viewing this Sunday morning, March 15th message online. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? And then we'll look into the word of God this morning. Father, we thank you that you are a sovereign God and that nothing escapes your notice or is out of your ultimate control. Our president has declared today as a national day of prayer. And so we do come to you and we look to you, our refuge and our strength. We pray for those affected by COVID-19. Heal them, we pray, and bring them back to a full measure of health. We ask for courage and protection for healthcare workers who risk their own well-being for the sake of others. And we pray that you would give wisdom to government officials and those in decision-making positions. May they rightly discern what needs to be done. And now, Lord, as we look into your word, we ask that the Spirit of God would give us understanding. Help us to apply this text of Scripture to our lives, that we may be changed people, having encountered the true and living God. And all of this we pray in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. How do you like this book, this big monster? <laughs> it is a 1400 page Greek New Testament grammar book. It's the standard grammar that's used in many seminaries today. It was the grammar that I used back when I was taking classes, Greek classes at seminary. We used to affectionately referred to this book as Big Bobby <laughs> because it was written by a man named Archibald Thomas Robertson. Robertson was one of the foremost Greek New Testament scholars of the 20th century, and he taught at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. On Monday, September the 24th, 1934, Robertson was teaching one of his Greek classes there at the seminary. He began the class by writing a few words up on the chalkboard. And then he began to feel ill. And so he dismissed the class and he went back home to lie down. Shortly after that, he suffered a stroke and two hours later, he was in the very presence of the Lord. One student caught the significance of that moment. And so he went back to the classroom and took a photograph of the final words of A.T. Robertson. That photograph was then passed from student to student, from faculty member to faculty member. The picture was treasured by those who loved Dr. Robertson. Now, if men can have such a deep appreciation for the last words of a human teacher, how much more should we revere the last words of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? So I invite you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke 
chapter 24. Over the last three years here at Shiloh on Sunday mornings, we have been walking through the Gospel of Matthew. Some would say that we've been crawling through the Gospel of Matthew. We've been looking at Matthew's Gospel paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, and we just concluded chapter 28 in the post-resurrection ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the other gospel writers, Mark, Luke, and John, also tell us about the words and works of Jesus in his post-resurrection ministry. And so we want to consider what Luke, the third gospel writer, has to say regarding Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Well, in Luke chapter 24, we find Jesus' last words as recorded in this gospel. So what final thoughts, what parting words did Jesus leave us, his followers? Well, in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36, I find four lasting impressions that Jesus left his followers. The first lasting impression is this, the reality of the resurrection. And I find this beginning in verses 36 and 37. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. And so the disciples were terrified. They thought that they were seeing a ghost. They, they weren't thinking that they were seeing a resurrected Christ. But why is that? They had all the evidence that they needed. They knew that the stone had been rolled away from the mouth of the tomb. They knew that the body of Jesus was missing from the tomb. They knew that angels had appeared to women and told them that Jesus was alive. He was resurrected. And even some of their very own, those women, saw Jesus on that first resurrection morning. And so why didn't they think it was a resurrected Jesus before them? I think the answer is found right here in our text, in verse 41. It says, And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement. You see, it, it seemed too good to be true to them. They, they just couldn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, let's not be too hard on the apostles. Let's cut them a little slack here. After all, we have had this text for us the last 2,000 years. We've been examining it. We know the story. For them, it was still fresh before them because they never expected this to happen. You see, the Jews back in the first century believed in a bodily resurrection. But they believed that the resurrection was going to take place in the end times, on the last day of judgment. You remember what Martha said to Jesus after her brother Lazarus died? Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And so the Jews weren't expecting a resurrection of the dead until the end of time, until the last days. And so seeing the resurrected Christ before them right then and there was just too good to be true for the disciples. But it was Jesus, and Jesus proved to them that he was standing before them. Look at verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubt arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. So Jesus first showed the nail prints in his hands and in his feet to the apostles to prove to them that he was standing 
right there before him. So even in his resurrected state, the Lord Jesus still had those nail prints in his resurrected body. One Christian author writes, The only work of man currently in heaven are the marks of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus continues in verse 39. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So after Jesus shows them that he is alive, he invites them to touch him. So his resurrected body was a material type of a body that actually had flesh and actually has bones. Continuing in verse 40, we read, When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, this had to be a life-changing situation for the apostles. Not only had Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, not only had Jesus defeated death through his resurrection, but it also gave the apostles a glimpse into their own future what the Lord had in store for them. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So if Christ were the firstfruits, the, the first one to be raised with the resurrection body, what did that then mean for the disciples? It meant that their future was secure. If Jesus was raised from the dead in a resurrection body, they likewise will one day be raised from the dead and have a glorified body, just like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that then mean to you as a 21st century believer today? It means that your future is secure. It means that one day you will be raised from the dead. You likewise will have a glorified, changed, transformed, resurrected body, just like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reality of the resurrection should make a deep and lasting impression on our lives today as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And if you have placed your trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, he will one day raise you from the dead as well. The reality of the resurrection. But that's not all. There's another lasting impression that we see here in our text. Lasting impression number two is this, the necessity of the cross. Verse 44 reads, He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Now it's important to understand that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was not a plan B for God. It wasn't as if the religious leaders of the Jews put Jesus to death and then God suddenly thought, 
boy, I, I just didn't see that coming. This is really a shock. This is really a surprise. Well, what am I going to do now? Um, maybe I can uh, raise Jesus from the dead. <laughs> that wasn't it at all. It was always God's plan to have Christ suffer, die for our sins, and then be raised from the dead. And I, I notice here that Jesus mentions three necessities. Because verse 46 states, he told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, of those three activities that this verse mentions, two of them only Jesus Christ could perform and fulfill. Only Jesus Christ could suffer for our sins and die on a cross for the penalty for our sins. And only Jesus Christ could rise from the dead. But the third activity remains for us to do, to share this good news with others. And so in Scripture, we find that the Lord doesn't do for ourselves what we can do for ourselves. Uh, for example, take Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary. You recall that in John chapter 11, Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. When Jesus called Lazarus forth from that tomb, that was something that only Jesus could do. But when Lazarus came out of the tomb, Jesus commanded those that were there to unwrap the grave clothes from Lazarus. Now, why didn't Jesus do that? If Jesus caused Lazarus to become alive again, why, why didn't he just unwrap the grave clothes from Lazarus? Uh, why did he have others do that? Because Jesus will do what only Jesus can do. But what we can do, Jesus leaves to us. And why does he leave it to us? so that we can become co-laborers, co-workers with him and to receive a reward. And that's true in this whole message of salvation. Only Jesus Christ could die on a cross for our sins. Only Jesus would be raised from the dead to prove that his death satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God against our sin. And now this message, this good news of Jesus Christ, is entrusted to us. That's what we can do. We can share this good news with others. There's an apocryphal story. You, you won't read about it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or the rest of the New Testament. There's an apocryphal story that states that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he was met by the angels. And the angels asked Jesus what plan he had to carry on the work that he started there on earth with the evangelization of the world. And Jesus replied to the angels, I have left that in the hands of my followers. The angels followed up with the question, and what if they fail? What other plan do you have? To which Jesus replied to the angels, I have no other plan. You see, we are his plan. God is not going to send an angel from heaven to come down here to earth to preach the good news, to share the gospel with your friends and your neighbors, your relatives and your co-workers. That is a responsibility that God has given to you. That's a responsibility that God has given to us as a church to share this great news, to share this message of salvation with others. God has given us that responsibility. 
to share about the necessity of the cross. And that leads us then to the third lasting impression, which is the urgency of the task. Verse 47 says, And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The task is urgent because there is no other way to get to heaven. Now, I realize that that's not politically correct to say that. Because most people believe that there are multitude of ways to get to heaven. That as long as a person is sincere, and as long as a person just does what he thinks he should do, and, and tries his best, that God will eventually just allow that person into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father but through me. It is only through Jesus Christ that we ultimately come to the Father and gain access to his presence in heaven. And the Apostle Peter agrees with us. Uh, the Apostle Peter said the same thing in the book of Acts. Peter declared, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ that we have our sins forgiven. It is only through trust in Jesus that we have eternal life. My friend, do you believe that? If so, then God wants you to be his witness. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be witnesses. We're not called to be judges. We're not called to be prosecuting attorneys. We are called to be witnesses. And witnesses simply testify as to what they know to be true. You know, I know that there are some people who don't share the gospel simply because they don't believe they know the Bible well enough. They believe that they need to be well-versed in everything from Genesis through Revelation before they share the gospel. Because somebody might ask them a question that they don't know the answer to, and they might really botch up a gospel presentation, and the person won't get saved. But we shouldn't let that bother us. When I share the gospel, I don't know all the answers. And when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, uh, do you know what I do? I simply tell them to contact our executive pastor here at Shiloh, Bob Lehman, because Bob knows everything. No, I'm, I'm just kidding you. I, I'm kidding you. No, when, when somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer to it, I simply write that question down and tell the person that, I'll look it up or I'll get back to him on it, but then I don't stop there. I, I continue to share the good news with them and to give them an opportunity to trust in Christ as their Savior. So the good news is simple to share. If you know John 3.16, you can share the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. All you need to do is explain to the person that God sent Jesus here to earth to die on a cross for our sins. And that if we only believe in Jesus, that is, trust in him to forgive our sins, that he'll do just that. 
He will forgive our sins and he will give us eternal life. So we won't go to hell when we die. We won't perish, but we'll have eternal life. We'll go to heaven to be in the very presence of God when we leave this earthly scene. Remember, you are not called to be a know-it-all. You are simply called to be a witness, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. You're called to testify that eternal life is through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And then that actually leads us to the fourth lasting impression. And that is the sufficiency of the scriptures and the spirit. Look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. My friend, the word of God is powerful. And so I encourage you to use the scripture when you share Christ with others. And you don't even have to memorize a whole number of verses from the Bible. Just memorize John 3.16 or carry your New Testament with you so that you can just show the person and have them read it for themselves. But the word of God is powerful and we need to use the scriptures, the word of God in sharing Christ with others. And then verse 49 I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. In Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would come upon certain people at certain times to perform certain tasks. There was not a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in Old Testament times. But when Jesus ascended into heaven and the Spirit of God came down upon believers in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, from that time forward, every believer has been indwelt personally by the Spirit of God himself. And Jesus told his disciples for to wait for the power of the Spirit, and they received it on the day of Pentecost. And they relied on the Spirit of God to give them the strength and the help that they needed in sharing the good news of Jesus. And we need to do the same. We need to rely on and depend on the Spirit of God who lives within us as we share the good news of Jesus with others. Because it is the Spirit of God who convicts hearts. It's the Spirit of God that opens eyes and shows people their need of a Savior. In Luke chapter 24, we read of Jesus' final words in this gospel. And they're words that made four lasting impressions on the hearts of those first disciples. And they still today continue to make the same deep impression upon us as followers of Christ in the 21st century. The reality of the resurrection. The resurrection is your guarantee of a life beyond the grave. Jesus Christ said, because I live, you will live also. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then the Lord Jesus promises you that one day he will resurrect your body. It'll be a perfect body, a changed body, just in the likeness of his resurrection body that you will live in for the rest of eternity. My friend, that should make a deep and lasting and abiding imprint in your heart today. The necessity of the cross. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died on a cross for your sins. And your sins are forgiven. The moment you place your faith alone in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness, he gives you eternal life. And that is a gift that can never be lost. 
It can never be revoked. It can never be taken away from you. You are eternally secure. The moment you close your eyes in death, you will be absent from the body and present with the Lord, all because of Christ taking care of your sin problem on the cross. The urgency of the task. God has commissioned us as his followers to share this good news with others. So I encourage you to ask God to give you opportunities to share the gospel with others. And then buy up those opportunities as God gives them to you to share the gospel with others. The only message of hope that God has given us. And then the sufficiency of the scriptures and the spirit. My friend, you are not left on your own. God has given you his word and he's given you his spirit and they supply you with the power you need to be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Four deep lasting impressions that God has given us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for these final words that we read of in Luke's gospel. And Father, these four lasting impressions, may they make an indelible mark in our hearts and lives today and cause us to be different, changed individuals and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.